Good morning. This is Mother Alison. We meet in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is Pentecost, and we celebrate the story at the beginning of the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church with great power. In fact, the story is one of power and force, a violent wind, what looked like tongues of fire, flames coming from the disciples. Disciples being filled with joy and enthusiasm, rushing out into the streets, praising God at the tops of their voices, and a great crowd gathering, running to find out what was happening. And of course, the great miracle is that the crowd could hear these Galilean disciples with their local dialect all speaking in their own tongue, wherever they came from and however far away so that the church had many thousand added to their number that day. It is almost a reversal of the story of the Tower of Babel in the Old Testament, when God confused the language of the people building the tower to stop them building it, to cause miscommunication. This was after the story of Noah's Ark and the flood, and when people began to multiply, and decided that they wanted to build for themselves a great name, a great tower, possibly a ziggurat, reaching up into the heavens, so that all people would see how great they were. And we have those wonderful verses from chapter 10. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built, and the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. And so God introduced miscommunication. And the result was the tower was never finished. Now hopefully we have been trying to do the opposite since Easter and particularly since Ascension Day. Between Ascension Day and today, Pentecost, we have been devoting ourselves, like the first disciples, in prayer to God and with love for one another as we seek for God's kingdom to come. Trying to be one people across this one deanery, one people across different denominations, as with one mind and one purpose, we have striven to pray, thy kingdom come here, to this place, to our community, to our people and to those on our hearts and in our minds. And perhaps this is partly the blessing of Pentecost, that when God's people gather as one, with one mind and one purpose, the blessing is that communication is restored. And others will hear our message and they will be blessed just like the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on the church with great power. And so as we celebrate Pentecost, we too ask that the Holy Spirit would fall upon us as his people with great power so that we too may grow God's kingdom. Of course, when we turn to our gospel reading this morning, we find a different story about the coming of the Holy Spirit on Jesus' disciples. In John's gospel, unlike Luke's, it doesn't happen 50 days later. Instead, it happens on the day of Easter itself, on the evening of that first day, when the disciples were gathered together in fear in a locked room, when Jesus appeared amongst them, and he said, I bring you my peace. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathed upon them. Quite a different reception of the Holy Spirit. There was no violent wind or flames of fire or shouting or exuberance. In fact, we don't hear any more about it. So does that mean that John's Gospel was not the, the accurate version? And we should look to Luke's? Or is Luke's not what really happened? As with any theological debate, 
when there is a question of either or, the answer often comes out as both. Could John's Gospel correctly reflect the coming of the Holy Spirit and Luke's? Maybe it's a bit like us. At your baptism, when you were baptised, you received the Holy Spirit when the priest baptised you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And perhaps you were aware of a gentle presence, blessing in your life. Or maybe you don't remember anything at all. But at our baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit as a deposit, a guarantee of our salvation. And when we read further in the New Testament, we hear that Timothy, who was blessed with the Holy Spirit when he was prayed for, was told to fan into flame the Spirit which was given to him, to stir up that which was within him. And so perhaps when Jesus called his disciples and asked them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit that was to come upon them, and they waited, devoted in prayer, to God and to each other. Maybe they were stirring up that Holy Spirit that had been given to them on Easter Day. So that when the day of Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit fell on them with great power because they had stirred up within them what had already been deposited as a guarantee. In which case we too need to stir up that Holy Spirit that is within each one of us. For we are temples of the living God, and God himself said that he would come and dwell within us, not in the form of God the Father, the sustainer, the creator of the universe, or the form of God the Son, our friend, intercessor, but in the form of God the Holy Spirit our mentor, our supporter, our encourager, but just as much God as the Father and the Son because all are God. That great God dwelling within us. What an amazing thought. This is what is referred to in our third reading, the one from 1 Corinthians when Paul lists the marks or the gifts of those who have received the Holy Spirit and what we might see in other Christians. The first three he lists are to do with great faith, wisdom, knowledge. I expect you're aware of Christians that seem to have such incredible faith or they're very wise or they seem to know the right thing or things that we need to know great gifts to have. We need them in the church today, faith, wisdom and knowledge. And the second group of three are about great power, miraculous signs, healing, discernment of spirits. And they're really useful as well. I have prayed for many people and occasionally had the great privilege of seeing people healed through prayer. It is amazing. And those people who seem to know, that, who seem to be able to discern what is this of God or is this not of God, should we as a church be going this way? Is this something we want to keep away from? They are invaluable. And anyone who can do, perform or do miraculous signs in order to convince others that God is real, that is someone we need in our church today. Of course, the third group is slightly more controversial because it's about the gift of speaking in different languages or tongues or interpreting that which has been spoken or the gift of prophecy. But I think we need those gifts just as much as we need the others. We need the prophets today who will speak out and speak up and guide us as to what God's wisdom is for this generation or speak out about social injustice in our community today. And we need those who are willing to pray, even if it means praying in another language, but are willing to devote themselves to prayer for and on behalf of the church. But of course, all these gifts or marks of the Holy Spirit 
need to be done decently and in order. And in fact, Paul devotes the entirety of the next chapter in the in the book of 1 Corinthians to just how the church should regulate and operate these gifts so that everything is done decently and in order. But that does not mean we don't need them. We need the power of the Holy Spirit today and we need the great power, not the gentle blessing that we had at our baptism, but the stirring up of the mighty power of God within us. So that we as temples of the living God can proclaim him, can live for him, can be his witnesses, especially now when our church buildings are locked, so much more now we need as temples of the Holy God to be his witnesses to those around us. And we need his gifts and his power in our church. Now I know that there is so much more we could say about this and you may have many questions, so let's keep the conversation going. Please contact me. Let's talk about this and let's see how we can be a church of spirit-filled people proclaiming God's word today devoted to see the kingdom, God's kingdom come to our world, to our nation and to our people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, stir up within us that gift, that deposit of the Holy Spirit which you placed within us at our baptism. Help us to recognise you and to know you and to be led by you. And help us to work together as one people, communicating well for your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.